Romans chapter 12 is where we are at this morning. We continue to look at the application of God's glory. That's what we are called to as believers. We're called to that because of the work that God has done within us to glorify God. God, we, we exist to express the glory of God. That's why man was created as an expression of his glory in unique ways, because man was outfitted with meant God's image. So man has special capacities and abilities to uh, relate to God, and capacities and abilities to express the likeness of God, and we are created to express God's glory. And through salvation, meaning justification, and then our process in growing in sanctification, ultimately ultimately glorification, it is there to express God's glory. So Paul now is saying, you, as believers, God has done the work in us, and is doing the work in us, to where now we have the capacities active within us, through redemption, to express God's glory. He can call us to that, he can command us to that, he can exhort us to uh, the expression of his glory because he has given us the capacities in the new man, in the new nature that we possess, to actually do that. To actually use our will, to actually use our capacity to exercise choice, to choose his will. It, it would not be, it's not a matter of frustration, it's a matter of being able to do what God has called us to do. Do, God created man to do, which is to express his glory, to be an expression of his glory in the unique ways that we can as human beings. So Paul says, because of that, because of these realities in our salvation, we are to be presenting ourselves, our bodies to God as a living sacrifice daily. And then as we are doing that, we are to be... Um, Transform continuously in that process of transformation by the renewing of our thinking, that we are called to think differently. We can now, because we are believers, because God has given us a new nature, and we're able to think in ways that we weren't able to think before, we're able to connect dots of truth, of understanding, in ways that we were not able to be before our salvation. We can now interact with the Word of God, grow in our understanding of the Word of God, and with that, our minds are renewed. Our thinking is renewed. It's a process. It's being renewed. And so we, as believers, we are called to the transformation by the renewing of our minds so that we can demonstrate what that perfect and good and acceptable will of God is. We can actually demonstrate that in our life. And that is all foundational to what Paul is saying to us in these verses. And he first calls us then, in, in the next line of thought, to humble service. That we are to serve one another with a growing humility in each and every one of us, to where we mutually serve God and have a mutual correct view of ourselves and a growingly uh, correct view of ourselves. And as a result of that, we use the abilities and the gifts that God gives us to serve him and to serve one another. And we do so enthusiastically and with confidence. Now we move into a third area in this chapter, that our fourth area that Paul talks about, and that is lifestyle. Through the end of the chapter, Paul is now giving a series of short, specific, concise exhortations and they deal with lifestyle. Lifestyle in, in, as far as practice, behavior, attitude, disposition. It's all lifestyle. And we express God's glory through our lifestyle, through the lifestyle that he's called us to. So again, as we are exposed to these exhortations, we can choose to practice these by the grace and power of God because we have a renewed Man, we have a capacity now to understand and then say, okay, God, I understand what you're saying, and I choose to do this and do it. So now we begin 
going through verses 9 through 21. And there's about 20 exhortations here. We're not going to get through all 20 of them this morning, but we will begin that journey through these exhortations uh, concerning lifestyle. And Paul begins, not untypically, with an emphasis that he has not only in Romans, um, but also to the Corinthians, and he has in others of his letters, and that's the emphasis of love. Above all else, the virtue and grace that is to characterize our lives as followers of Jesus Christ is love. And Paul, as he starts this journey with us, he says, let love be without hypocrisy. Literally in the Greek, it says, love without hypocrisy. Start there, because that, that governs everything as far as our, our relationship to God and our walk before God and our walk with one another. Love. Uh, this word for uh, hypocrisy um, means someone who is not genuine, someone who is not sincere, who does what they do, not being out of genuine motive, but has an appearance that uh, he or she are doing something for one reason, but it's really for another. It, it's hypocritical. It's not genuine. It's not sincere. And he's saying, as we love one another, let's not do it with ulterior motives. Let's not do it for the sake of simply how we appear to other people. Let's really love one another. And it's agape, which is emphasizing that um, other-oriented love, that action-oriented love. It's not a love that's focused on ourselves. It is a love that's focused on others. And the determination that, hey, I'm committed to the Lord, I'm committed to you, and I want to do what's best. I want to do what's best for you. I want what's best for you. I'm going to invest myself in doing what's best for you. And doing it with genuineness. So Paul says that's where our lifestyle begins, is love. And, and a sincere love. Obviously a sincere love for God, but in this context he's talking about a sincere love for one another. That needs to govern every part of our walk and every part of our relationship with everyone in the body of Christ. Specifically, that needs to govern our walk and our relationship to everyone here at JBC. We are to let that define our relationship. We choose that relationship. We choose this action. We choose this course. And it doesn't mean that it's without affection or without emotion, but it means that this is first and foremost a choice that we make. That in the relationships that we have with one another, JVC, that we are determined that we are going to operate in a spirit and in a disposition and in an action, in an action of love. That we are actually going to do what's best for one another. There's other exhortations that come along a little bit later and talk about the, the warm affectionate side of love, different words used. But here it's talking about, hey, first and foremost, let's do what's best. Let's do what's needed. Let's do what benefits the other person. This is a family of words that expresses God's love for all of humanity. He, he does what is best. He does what is beneficial for all of humanity. Therefore, we read the passage in John chapter 3 and verse 16, for God so loved the world, not just the elect, not just the, um, the church. God so loved the world that what happened? That he what? That he gave. That he gave. We'll fill in the other blanks later. But then he gave. You see the action? What, what was needed and what was beneficial for humanity? To be redeemed from our sins. Because as we know from the scriptures, mankind has become, had become corrupted by sin and still is corrupted by sin. There is nothing inherent to us individually or collectively that is compelling to God as far as deserving his love, or compelling his love. God's action 
was not dependent upon how he felt. God's action was driven by the need that he saw and that determination that I am going to address that need. And therefore, I'm going to give because that's what's required. I need to give of myself to meet the needs of those that I've created. And what I must give is I must give my son. Because only through him can that need be addressed. So I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but I'm wanting us to follow through the progression here. For God loved the world and loves the world, and he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. And so therefore, out of love, he gave of himself in the person of Jesus Christ so that we would not have to perish but we would have everlasting life. If we would do... The one thing that he requires to appropriate that, and that is to trust him, to believe. It's the same word used here. And, and I lay that out for us in our thinking so that as we think about our interaction with one another, it's not focused on ourselves, but it's focused on putting the others in our church family ahead of us first and loving them by doing what is best, doing what is going to benefit them, truly benefit them in their lives. Love one another. Let it be without hypocrisy. Do it with sincerity and genuineness. So that's where Paul begins. In the letter to the Corinthians, he wrote concerning spiritual gifts, now abides faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. That's just one example of how Paul elevates and brings to our attention the priority and the importance of love. So that is a choice that we make daily, to love. And we, we understand that love in the context of God, of his love, and that's the love that he calls us to. So... We, we don't go searching for a definition of love apart from God and his word. We seek to understand love as it's revealed in God's word, as it, is, as it is expressed by God, because that is the love that we are to express. And that glorifies God. When we love one another, and as we love one another that way, God's glory is being expressed through us. He then goes on to say, Abhor evil. Abhor evil. We're going to cling, uh, not cling, but we're going to address both of these uh, points um, that are in this verse together, but let you see the distinction between them because there are two different uh, exhortations, uh, almost two different sides of the coin here. Abhor evil, cling to good. So on one side of the coin, God says, as believers, as his children, we need to be abhorring evil. Now this word evil, uh, or abhor, means to despise, to have a strong dislike for, to hate. I don't like Chinese food. Some parts of it I do. But it's kind of a standing, not a joke, but a standing uh, understanding that when, we, when I go to the pastor's meetings that we have in Princeton, Indiana, I see a pastor. We always go out for lunch once we get a meeting. And they always ask, are you staying? Because sometimes I need to come back. Because I drive to Fergus to get there. And the reason they ask is, if you're not coming, we're going to have Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care for Chinese food. I've tried it several times. And if I'm going to spend money going out to eat, I'm going to eat something that I 
like. Okay. And uh, so I can't say that I like it, but I do not abhor it. I guess that illustration helps us to begin to see the, the difference. I don't despise Chinese food. I don't have a strong dislike for are to have that kind of a disposition and thinking, not just a feeling, but thinking according to what God says here, toward that which is evil. Evil is that which is morally objectionable, wicked, immoral, and the result worth. We are to afford that and buy it. Now let's come to the other side of the coin here. Claim that which is good. Let's do a little bit more talking about this, but let's understand the concept. Claim means to the good. Claim means to join oneself to. To become a part of. To marry yourself. As as uh, husband and wife were told to cling to one another in Genesis. That's, that's a permanent clinging. That's a, a total clinging. Committing yourself to one another completely. You get the idea of cling here. That which is good, link arms with it tightly and hold on to it. Embrace the good as the good embraces you. And good is the, in the word concept that which is morally excellent. Truly admirable. Now the question is this. One of the questions. What's evil? How do we determine what is evil and what is good? Because that has become, um, there's a different understanding in, in some ways on what is evil and what is good. I've seen transitions of that in my lifetime in the context of our, our culture. I'm not going to go into particulars on that uh, because that's not the focus here. But just to point out that the way that the, the general culture perceives that which is morally acceptable, morally good, that which is morally unacceptable, um, that has been a, a changing phenomenon. And if we depend upon any given culture to determine that which is good in the eyes of the culture and evil in the eyes of the culture, then if we're in that culture long enough, more than likely there is going to be some transition that takes place and redefining that takes place. So the people are told that what was once considered unacceptable or morally um, objectionable no longer is. In fact, it should be embraced. How do we determine what is truly good and truly evil? How do we do that? You know the answer to that. Go into everybody. This becomes the source for understanding that which is morally good. Just what God says. And that which is morally objectionable. We can only begin to differentiate in an absolute and definitive manner that which is truly good and evil as we understand what God says in His Word. Therefore, it is necessary for you and I, in order to be growing in 
applying these exhortations to our lifestyle, it is necessary for you and I to what? Read the word, and with that seek to understand it. But we've got to expose ourselves to the thoughts, the truths, the concepts that God has expressed here. This is the morally absolute book. There are moral absolutes. Truth is not relative. Truth is not determined by man in the sense of ultimately or absolutely. He's not the determiner. God is. And we are to embrace truth and live truth and apply truth God says what is good and what is evil. So for us to be practicing these lifestyle exhortations, we need to be in God's Word, consistently having our minds filled with the truth of God's Word, and then what is talked about in verse 2 is happening. Our thinking is being renewed, and we are being transformed in the context of whatever culture we happen to live in on this globe. So we are called to be practicing. All of these are present tense, by the way. All the verbs are present tense, which means a continuous practice. To continuously be putting these exhortations into practice as it pertains to our lifestyle. And so, Love without hypocrisy, abhor the evil. God tells us what evil is. In action, in attitude, in our words, in, a, uh, in, in our disposition, in motive, uh, he addresses it all. And then he tells us that which is good and acceptable in his sight. And again, we go back to verse 2, but through the renewing of our mind, which comes from God's Word, we are then able to demonstrate or prove what that good and acceptable will of God is, that which is truly good and acceptable according to what God says. Cultures change, and cultures are different. But God's Word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because Jesus Christ is Continue on, and we see another exhortation. And here we get to the more affectionate side of love. In, uh, in this exhortation, verse 10, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. That's the first half of the verse. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. We're to be affectionate with one another. Genuine. That, that is to be what we bring to the table to some of those fellow believers. It doesn't mean that we're, that we don't show affection for others outside of the body of Christ. But within the body of Christ, Paul says, this is part of our new lifestyle. A kind affection for one another. Uh, this word kindly affection is one word and it means to be very loving with one another in, in an open, expressive way. Warmly devoted. Very affectionate. So as we come together as a church family, whether it's JBC or any other church family, according to God's call upon believers, shouldn't walk into an iceberg as far as relationships go. We are to be kindly affectionate another, not, not just in the sense of expressing affection, but uh, a, a more devoted commitment and relationship to one another, where we truly know that, that we are loved by one another. And then he goes on to, to use another word, with brotherly love. And this talks about a family familial or family affection, a warm, affectionate love. 
God gives us the different dynamics of love. You have agape that was in verse 9. This is from the, uh, part, the root word of, of uh, philos or philia, the verb phileo. And that's talking about that dimension of love, which is warm and affectionate. Agape is used by God to address all of humanity. God uses phileo. I remember learning this from Dr. Boyer in our Greek exegetical studies in seminary. It just stuck with me. Phileo is used only of God's relationship to his children. Because you have to have a relationship in order to express phileo. It's a warm, affectionate love. That's what the word is talking about, and unfortunately, there are families in our world and in our culture that they don't have an affectionate love in their family, so they might look at this word and say, well, if you look at my family, then I can't relate to that, because there just isn't that warm affection within the context of our family. But there's many families where that's the case. They have a warm, affectionate love for one another. Uh, it's not a kind of a distant thing. They embrace one another. There's relationship there. There's warmth there in the relationship. And that's what Paul's talking about here. In the body of Christ, in this church family, we are to have, continue to have, and be practicing a warm, affectionate love for one another. And it's not solely driven by or based upon how we feel. It's driven by choice. So that, that's the spirit of what Paul is talking about in this exhortation. Be kindly affectionate to one another in brotherly love. So when someone says, yeah, brother, so and so, I love him in the Lord, but I can't stand your guts. You know, hey, or I'm going to love you in the Lord because I really don't like you at all. And I'm not going to like you. I will never like you. But I will love you in the Lord. No! That does not stack up to the exhortation here. Get over yourself. Get over myself. God's love is not limited by our flesh. God's love explodes our flesh and enables us to get beyond ourselves where we truly have a warm affection for one another. But we make that choice. We put our flesh in check and our flesh on hold, and we say, by God's grace, this is what you call me to. I don't feel like it right now. My flesh doesn't feel like it. But I'm going to choose to be have, have a love for one another that isn't, I love you in the Lord. What that probably means is, I love you in the Lord, but don't come near me. That's <laughs> like, God's grace to work within me to bring the fire to my heart to bring the true affection of love. So this is what we're called to. I want to apply it in the context of JBC. A warm affection of love for one another. And I, I believe I see that a lot. I'm not saying that because I think I don't see it. I do see it a lot in our church family. But let's continue in that Fellow believers. He goes on to give us a few more exhortations. And uh, well, in this verse as well, the end of verse 10. In honor, giving preference to one another. So here the emphasis is on give preference. Give preference to each other. So this word for preference means to highly respect, to be ahead of others, to be first, to prefer, to esteem highly. So it's not saying here, put yourself first. Don't put yourself ahead of others. It's saying, do others this way. Give them preference. Put them first. Put them ahead of you. And whatever it is, Prefer them. Esteem them. Respect them. Don't, don't be putting yourself at the front of the equation of whatever the relationship is. Prefer them. 
and honor. That's what it's getting at, is that respect. Give preference. Put them ahead of yourself. Give preference to one another. So do so in an honoring way. Respect them in a respectful way. Put our fellow believers here at JBC ahead of each and every one of those things. Prefer one another. This is the disposition that, that we're called and commanded to. We can do it because we are born again, because of God's work of grace in us. We have the new man. We, we are the new man. We are the new creation. We have the new nature. We can do this. Not because of our own self-determination, but because of who we are in Christ. We can have this disposition and actually do it. So as we have a fellowship lunch, and there's a big piece of dessert there, and there's only X number of pieces, we don't orchestrate it where we make sure that we get there first, but we want to make sure we have people we prefer one another. That's just a silly little example, but it helps us to see um, Mary Ann, and maybe not. <laughs> Doesn't make any difference. Doesn't matter if you're Italian or not, Sicilian or not, Sicilian or not. You're a different person in Christ. You can do this. <laughs> but in all seriousness, prefer one another. But in verse eleven, he goes on. Consistently diligent, not lagging in diligence. Lagging means to be lazy, without full effort, um, half-hearted. He says, "Don't be that way." The flip side of this is what Paul said to uh, the Colossians. He said, "In, in, in word or deed, in whatever you do, do it all well." Glory of God. To the glory of God. That's the opposite of lagging. Fully putting ourselves into it. Paul said to the Corinthians that regardless of what's going on in our lives, we make it our aim to be well pleasing to the Lord. That's diligence. Diligence requires focus. Focus on God, focus on His call in our lives as in our lifestyle. Uh, not lagging in diligence. So eagerness, genuine enthusiasm to accomplish the devotion, obviously, to who and what God has called us to be, individually and collectively as a body of believers. We need to be engaged, heart, mind, and soul, with diligence to all that God's called us to. So with all of these exhortations, let's not lag in diligence, is what Paul is saying. Let's, let's enthusiastically embrace these truths and, and live them and apply them. And he goes on, fervent in spirit. Fervent in spirit means it's using the concept of boiling water. And as the water comes to that appropriate temperature where it boils, it's bubbling, and uh, it, it's really active, the water's really active. Uh, and so it, that, that's a word picture that is used with this word fervent. Uh, it's talking about enthusiasm, genuine enthusiasm, not just the outward, superficial, temporary enthusiasm. I mean, I've been in my share of locker rooms uh, where the coach gives a, a pep talk before game, and the purpose of that is to get you enthused about the game that you're about to get into, hopefully to give you a little bit of an edge, perhaps a lot of an edge, as you go into that game that you you enthusiastically engage yourself, whether it's football, basketball, baseball, or any other sport, that, that you're going into it, and man, you've got your emotions in it, you've got your thoughts in it, you're focused, and you're going after it, you're enthused, you're devoted, and that lasts for maybe the puck talk, maybe the first quarter, or the first inning, or whatever portion. 
But Paul is saying not that kind of fervency, but to completely commit ourselves in an ongoing, consistent way in our spirits from within. Lord, I'm committed to you and I'm committed to this lifestyle that you've called us to, to live it. And it comes from within, Lord. It, it's not based upon what happens around me and how pe people respond around me. It's based upon where I'm at in, in my spirit, in my soul, in my inner man. That fervency of spirit. Lord, I am committed to, to you and to this lifestyle from within, regardless of what I encounter. By the way, situation, circumstance, and people. Wow. Easy read, hard to do. But by God's grace, very good. And then, lastly this morning, serve the Lord. Then what we do, we do it as service to the Lord. We need to understand that everything about us, now as believers, as an expression of God's glory, is service to Him. We're created as servants. We're created to serve Him and to express His glory through our service to Him. This word, serve, duluo, uh, there's different words for serve, uh, but it, it, it speaks of serving from the vantage point of being a slave or a servant. And in that vantage point, you serve to accomplish the Lord's will, the Lord's desire. And Paul says, that's how we serve the Lord. With diligence, with fervency, we serve the Lord. Our focus on, Lord, what's your will? Lord, what's your desires? And when we're asking those questions, it's not on, all right, what, what do I want? It's, Lord, what's your will? What do you desire? You know, direct my steps today. May, may my thoughts and my heart and my affections be upon you and upon my fellow believers. Lord, your will, your desires. God's will is what we've covered this morning and much more. And this is God's will, God's desire, that we live life this way as an expression of his glory. And we're blessed and we've been So I call us to continue to dwell on these exhortations and these truths and by God's grace to seek to actually apply them, continue to apply them in the context of our lives. Let's do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together in your word. We thank you for these wonderful truths. Lord, we especially thank you for the work of grace that you have accomplished in our lives to bring us to faith in Christ. And with that, to Renew us, to uh, cause us to be born again, to regenerate us, to uh, give us new life, Lord, and make us new creatures, to give us a new nature by which we can know you and relate to you and honor you and follow you and please you. And Lord, with the capacity to choose your will and to do so, Father, eagerly and uh, with enthusiasm. So, Father, Continue to teach us and help each of us to apply 